For clip note 33, we're going to be looking at extensions of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So for number one here, it says the FTC is an accumulation. So remember, when we integrate, we remove the rate. So uh, oftentimes, you integrate to find a change in something, a change in population or a change in an amount. So the integral by itself, just like what we have here and here, the integral by itself, if you find the antiderivative, that answer gives the total population or water or sand or traffic or anything like that, et cetera, uh, between time as, uh, time as A and time B. So this is just, if they're asking you to explain the meaning of an integral, is just a change in something, the change that occurred. Now, um, the fundamental theorem of calculus as a final position, integrate to find the end, so if you're interested in a certain position, we have to know what the initial condition was, and then we can add the change that occurred. So if you're talking about um, a location, we have to know where the particle started, and then add any um, change by integrating the velocity. Okay, and so this is just kind of, this equation right here is just the generic form of, of a, a total amount at the end of some requested time that you're looking for. All right, so let's look at a couple examples that involve these formulas. All right, so we got this little particle, and uh, he's moving along the y-axis. So I guess that means he's just either going up or down, up or down, so that, and we have the velocity equation for time values greater than or equal to zero. Given that S of t represents the position equation, the antiderivative, if you want to think about it that way, of velocity, Given that the S of T is the position of the particle and that here's an initial condition, the guy started at three, let's find out where he was um, two seconds later. So really, it just depends upon what this graph is doing uh, between zero and two, meaning if this graph is positive, then this little particle is just going straight up from three. If the velocity is always negative between the time interval of zero and two, uh, then this guy is dropping from three. Uh, if there's a mixture of positive and negative values, uh, kind of hard to tell unless you look at the area between the velocity graph and the x-axis to determine, you know, did the particle travel more up? You know, because you have more of the graph that creates an area that's larger above the x-axis as opposed to below. All right, so let's do the setup according to the formula given ahead above us. So the position at 2 is going to be equal to the original position plus any change and we're going to get that from integrating from 0 to 2, the velocity equation. Okay, and I could have just simply put in this equation right here. Uh, this is a good time to replace S of 0 with 3 if you want. So this is a good one to integrate by hand. I mean, if I had a calculator and it was, you know, acceptable to use one, I'm certainly going to go and find this value by the, the necessary keystrokes. But for this one, I think we can find this uh, answer by hand. So let's kind of see how that takes place. It's going to be u substitution. u will be the inside function t squared. And du will be 2t dt. And because t is present as a factor, we're in good shape. We can bring in the 2 and pull out the 1 half. I'm just going to go ahead and arrange, rearrange here and put sine, sine t squared times, and I'm going to put the t behind, times t dt. And of course, we know we can't multiply these two together. It's just for the convenience of putting it in, in this order so that I can use u substitution. I need to bring in a 2 to replace all of this with D, DT, uh, DU, and then I need the 1 half out here. All right, so this gets replaced with U, and all of this is DU. And so when we look at this, we've uncomplicated that complicated integrand, and now we know that the antiderivative for sine u is going to be um, negative cosine u. 
at this point, if you wanted to, like in the previous video, if you wanted to stay with the U variable and not go back to, to T, what you could do is you could change these limits right here from zero to two um, to the U limits. And again, just to remind you, that would mean that when you plug zero in for T, because it was originally a T limit, you would still get zero as a lower limit. But when you plug in two for T, you're gonna get four, okay? Otherwise, when I integrate, I'm going to have to replace my u with t squared. So we've been doing that, so we're most comfortable, I think, with that technique. So we'll just go ahead and continue with that. So 3 plus 1 half. The antiderivative is negative cosine u. So I'll put the cosine here, but I'm going to put the negative in front, evaluated from 0 to 2. Okay, so I need to replace the u with t squared, so I'll do that. If you can avoid some of these steps that I'm doing, that's fine. I just wouldn't probably do too many mathematical, you know, um, things in one step. So 3 minus a half cosine t squared 0 to 2. So cosine of 4 minus cosine of 0. Well, without a calculator, I couldn't tell you what cosine of 4 was, so I guess I'm going to have to leave my answer with cosine of 4. Perfectly fine. Cosine of 4 is exact. If you change it to a decimal, that's an approximate. All right, so this is going to be 3, and then I think I'll go ahead and distribute the minus here. So 3 minus a half cosine 4, that becomes a plus, and cosine of 0 goes to 1, so that's just going to become a plus a half. So let's see, 3 plus a half, go ahead and combine those. Uh, that would mean that this was 6 halves, because that's equal to 3, so collecting with another half would be 7 halves minus a half cosine of four. Okay, and then you're, fi you're fine there, that you're done, but if you wanted to rewrite it as a single fraction, just one fraction in your answer, you'd have seven minus cosine of four on top. So let's take a look at example two. All right, so we have a piece of metal that's eight centimeters long and uh, it's heated at one end, like you're sticking it in a fire. Uh, the function t prime of x, this linear function, gives the temperature in degrees Celsius of the wire x centimeters from the heated end. So this appears to be a rate of change. Okay, so the units would be degrees Celsius divided by over x centimeters which doesn't really make a lot of sense, but um, it is what it is. And for the rate of change, it's degrees Celsius per um, the, the x centimeters from the end that you're heating. All right, we're asked to find this uh, answer right here and indicate units of measure, and then explain the meaning of the temperature of the wire. All right, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and set up the integrand. T prime of x is two x plus three. So easy enough. I don't need to get anything ready for integration. Uh, this goes back to x squared plus 3x. And we're going to evaluate that from 0 to 8. Uh, 8 squared. Okay, that's 64 plus 3 times 8 is 24. So uh, 64 plus 24. And love those zeros when everything has an x in it, every term has an x, because that's just zero. So that looks like 88. Indicate units of measure. Well, remember what it said up in the note card at the top. It says integrate a rate, lose the rate. Well, this is a rate right here, so we're going to lose the x centimeters. So it's 88 degrees Celsius. All right, now let's explain the meaning of the temperature of the wire. 
All right, well, thinking about what was said earlier, this represents a change in the temperature from the heated end to the opposite end in degrees Celsius. So kind of remember that saying nuts, let's do the number, the units, the time, but in this case, kind of interesting, there's no time. Instead, we're talking about a length. Okay, it's the X here instead, and then we're going to use a sentence. All right, so there it is. 88 degrees Celsius means the change in the temperature of the wire in degrees Celsius from X equals zero, the heated end, to the opposite end, to X equals eight centimeters. So again, think of that acronym NUTS. We've got the number here. Uh, I have the units of that number. I have the time, but like I said, in this case, um, that's going to be your independent or your limits, but instead of time, it's going to be X, the length of the wire, and then we have the sentence. All right, so this is just putting the FTC into practice in, in context with just different problems, problem situations. All right, we're going to take a look at next note card number 22. So if you want to take the time to flip back to number 22, I'll join you there in just a second. Yeah, so for this note card number 22, the MVT, the Mean Value Theorem and Rolls Theorem, which is a special case, you might want to take just a few minutes and, you know, read through these theorems. But um, as it comes to be, these are the formulas that we're going to be using. All right. And verbally, read through what it says and graphically what it means. All right, so we have a function, it's cubed, find C that satisfies the conclusion of the mean value theorem, okay, for uh, A to B, one to three, okay. So we're gonna need the derivative, and then we're gonna have to set it equal to the slope through these endpoints, where X is one and X is three also. So we've got some side work to do. I think right over here, hmm. Let me find the y at one. So plug one into the original. So one minus seven is negative six, plus six is zero. All right, let's find the functional value at three. So plugging in three, I'm gonna have cubit 27 minus 21 is six, plus six is 12. All right, another thing that I'm gonna need is the derivative, so I think I'll just go ahead and put that right here. So we're trying to figure out where the derivative is equal to the secant slope, the slope through the endpoints, the average rate of change. All right, three x squared minus seven. So I think I have everything I need. Um, the way they have the theorem, they use a C instead of an X. So everywhere you see X, you can replace it with C. It's not necessary. But I'll go ahead and do that. So I'm going to come up here. I'm going to rewrite the mean value theorem that says find where the derivative is equal to the average rate of change. All right, so the derivative evaluated at C gets replaced with 3C squared minus 7. And here I'm going to have F of three minus f of zero, oh, f of one, pardon me, over three minus one. All right, so let's find the slope and then we'll solve for c. So three c squared minus seven equals, and looking at the limited space here, I'm gonna come back up here to this line and I'm gonna actually put the numbers in that I found over here. So it's gonna be 12 minus zero over two. Easy enough, that's gonna be six. All right, so I'm supposed to find C, so let's add seven, divide by three, and find the square root. So add seven, get 13. C squared is equal to 13 over three. Bringing in the square root tells us we're gonna have two solutions. But in the context of this problem, remember, we're supposed to find a C value between A and B. Well, the negative square root isn't going to be the answer, so it must be the positive square root. And I would double check to make sure numerically it falls between those, and it does. Okay, so it's good to show all of this, but when you're going to state your final answer, okay, maybe state it somewhere else to the side. Okay, so that's the x coordinate between 1 and 3, where the slope is going to be the same as through um, both endpoints 
okay, of this piece of this graph. All right, looking at the time of this video, there's not going to be time for number two. We'll do that together um, at some other time. Let's look at number three. Determine if Rolle's theorem applies. If so, find C. If you look back up there, in order for Rolle's theorem to apply, I have to have f of b equal f of a. The y values have to be the same. Because if the y values are the same at the endpoints, then the slope through those two endpoints would uh, be zero. So all we have to do is, um, first of all, make sure that you know, this function is continuous and differentiable. And a fourth degree polynomial function is going to satisfy that condition. I mean, this is going to be continuous and differentiable. So the other thing for us to check is to uh, evaluate the function at each of these um, endpoint values, x values. So f of negative 2, plugging that in, gives 16 minus 2 times negative 2 squared. And uh, you might already see that because these exponents are even, uh, if you plug in a negative number, you're going to get a positive result um, from that. So I'm, I'm thinking, I'm pretty suspicious. I think that it's, it you know, is applicable. So 16 minus, this is 4, 4 times 2 is 8. Um, that's going to be 8. All right, so if the other y value is also 8, the slope between them would result in a 0. And we can use Rolle's theorem. So we're going to evaluate it 2. So 2 to the 4th is 16 minus 2 times 2 squared. And again, that's going to give us 8. So the answer to this question is yes. All right, and this last example, number four, goes pretty quick, so we'll try and get that in on this video as well. All right, when in doubt, produce a graph. You've got some ordered pairs here that you can plot, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. A picture is uh, going to be very helpful in trying to figure out what's true here. All right, so I've got the grid here from 1 to 10. I've plotted the three given points, 2, negative 5, 5, 5 and 9, negative 5. And going back, paying attention to what you're told, uh, it, tells, it tells me that the function that contains these points is differentiable. And that's real critical. If they told me that the function was continuous, but they didn't say differentiable, I'm purposely going to draw a sharp turn or a vertical tangent, something kind of strange. Okay, But uh, it is differentiable, so it has to be a smooth curve. So uh, I don't know what's happening between 1 and 2. I don't know where I'm at at x equals 1. Uh, all I do know is that these three points are contained on that, that graph. So in order for me to pick up all these points, I'm going to have to at least cut through the x-axis here. Now, I don't know what's happening. It might go higher. It might go lower. It might have a couple of bumps and turns in it. Okay, um, That shouldn't be a vertical tangent. But anyway, it, it could have you know various shapes. All right, so let's see if this is going to help us go through and figure out what, what has to be true. Does the function have to have at least two zeros? Yep. There's no way you can go from this point down here up to this point here and then back down to this point without cutting through the x-axis twice. All right, does the graph of the function have at least one horizontal tangent line? Absolutely it does, and it probably is going to have several. Okay, so there's no way you can go from increasing to decreasing and be differentiable without having a zero slope. So true. Uh, is it also true that for some c value between 2 and 5, all right, so let's look at that. Here's 2 and here's 5. Okay, that somewhere in between here, I have to pass through the horizontal line y equals 3. So think about that for a minute. If this is 3, okay. Am I going to have to, on my journey from this point to this point, pass through that horizontal line? This should be 3. Okay, yep, that's true too. So it appears that 1, 2, and 3 are true. Okay, and again, the picture is what reveals this to us. And uh, if anything, pay attention to the words that they give you or don't give you, more importantly. Uh, if they just say a function's continuous, again, like I said, purposely draw the graph so that it might have a vertical tangent um, or a sharp turn. And I think that's very, very revealing. All right, so this reviews the MVT and Rolle's theorem pretty quickly. And like I said, for this example, too, it just requires a little more time, and we don't have that time right now. We'll revisit it at a, at a later time.